All right, welcome everyone to um, Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar for the 8th of November. My name's, for those people who don't know me, uh, I'm Andrew Heap and I'm the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. Before we get into the formalities of the, uh, of the presentation, I just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, which for those of us here in Canberra is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, waters and community. And I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. So today's Wednesday seminar is a, is a, is a doozy. It's uh, by one of our distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturers for 2023, Dr Barry Bradshaw. And today Barry will be speaking about the art of play-based resource assessments, more than just a numbers game. Through Barry's science leadership, Geoscience Australia has adapted the play-based exploration resource assessment approach, established and used by the resources sector to assess multiple subsurface sediment hosted resources, including energy, groundwater and greenhouse gas storage. The work is also enhancing prediction of groundwater aquifer distribution and connectivity in Australia's underexplored regions. One of the key study areas is the Greater simpson paderka Eramanga region in Central Australia, which I'm sure will feature prominently and Barry's presentation today. While the outcome of this work will include quantitative appraisals of various resource commodities, a key aspect of Barry's presentation will highlight that in order to be realistic and reliable, the volumetric numbers produced in the play-based assessment are the result of integrated multidisciplinary geoscience studies that provide an improved regional understanding of Australia's energy resources potential. And it's something that really our organisation is highly, highly suited to do. In this work, it is this work that demonstrates Barry's science leadership over many years and which is being recognised today. Before I invite Barry up for the presentation, a little bit about him. I've known and worked with Barry probably for nearly 25 years. So it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce his distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture today. Barry is an esteemed geoscientist with over 30 years experience in various applied research projects with a wide ranging knowledge of Australia's sedimentary basins. He's currently leading the resource assessment, for, uh, sorry, currently leading the resource assessment work in Geoscience Australia Exploring for the Future program and also the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information program. The key objective of both programs directly supports Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028 impact area of building Australia's resources wealth, as well as identifying opportunities that will enable the responsible transition of the resources sector and support a future low emissions economy for Australia. Now, Barry, I'm going to cover it today, but I know your, your history is in coastal geomorphology and geology, and so maybe we'll see a bit of that, but, uh, but it's certainly come a long way from those early days that we first got together. So no pressure, Barry. So with that introduction, please join me wel in welcoming Barry to the lectern. Thank you very much for that introduction, Andrew. Um, coastal geomorphology, I'm afraid, is on the retirement plan. <laughs> uh, so, and thank you everybody who's um, come down to the theatre today or who's joined online um, to listen to my presentation. So I've showing you here the, um, the outline of what I'll be talking about. So first of all, why do we undertake um, basin resource assessments and particularly the increasing importance of identifying energy super basins that are gonna enable us to reach a net zero emissions um, future by 2050. And this means finding basins where we have favorable alignment of both um, existing gas resources and then potential geological storage and renewable hydrogen resources. I'll then talk about the importance of play-based resource assessments and particularly the um, systematic approach we take to um, understanding the geological controls on prospectivity and identifying whether there are potential future areas for resource developments. And finally, I'll finish by just showing um, um, a case study from some of the work we've done in East and Central Australia and particularly highlighting what might be an energy super basin in the um, Cooper Aramanga um, area. So I'm beginning by showing a chart from the IEA of the world's historical energy production versus global population growth. And it shows that we need a lot of energy to sustain an ever growing human population. In the last 40 years, um, we've doubled our energy production from 300,000 to 600,000 petajoules. That's a lot of energy. Australia produces about 3.2% of this. Um, we're about the world's seventh largest energy producer, so we really punch above our weight when it comes to energy production. 
But unfortunately, and as you can see on the, the chart here, about 80% of that energy comes from fossil fuels and clearly that's not sustainable into the future. So here I've added on historical greenhouse gas emissions data from the IEA and it shows that um, by about 20, uh, 2020, there was about 34.3 gigatons of CO2 being emitted each year. And only about 37 megatons of that, which is about 0.1%, was actually being captured and stored. So we've got a problem here that we, we need to solve. But unfortunately, the solution isn't just to, to cut all fossil fuel production right now. If we did that, I'll highlight it on the chart here, you would have an energy gap of about 470,900 petajoules. And just to give you an idea of the scale of that, one petajoule is about the energy you need to power up 37,183 homes. So that's a lot of solar panels, that's a lot of wind turbines. Um, you can't just simply stop producing fossil fuels now. And most governments, including our own, have recognised this and therefore come up with a plan to transition by 2050 away from fossil fuel usage. And the Australian government has committed to this, um, reaching the net zero target by 2050, as noted by Minister King at the APEA conference, and also noting that this needs to be underpinned by our resources sector. But in order to do this, we've got to identify what um, Wood Mackenzie referred to as energy super basins. And that's where we have a um, favourable alignment of um, existing and potential future um, resources, particularly gas resources, also opportunities for geological storage to abate any um, reservoir CO2 or other scope one emissions from those. And also importantly, to be able to transition by 2050 into um, not using fossil fuels, we need to identify where there's also potential for hydrogen production, particularly uh, renewable hydrogen production using uh, groundwater feedstock. So the first step we need to take in understanding where these super basins may be is to actually understand our existing hydrocarbon resources. And we do this every year at G-Science Australia by compiling a um, basin level inventory of gas resources, which we release in our annual ACRE publication. And this is based on um, data that's um, either published by companies um, through um, ASX, um, ASX listed companies, or we actually get the data from NOPTA for the offshore area. Queensland government also publishes this data. So we're able to accurately get an, an inventory each year of um, what our remaining um, resources are. And the example here from Acre is our gas resources. The flying saucer map you see there, the, um, the very dark tone colours are the reserves, the mid-tone colours are contingent resources, and the light tone ones as total production to date. And you can see there's a lot of um, resources on the Northwest Shelf, and also the purple ones um, over Queensland are the coal seam gas resources. So the, the reserves that um, we know currently exist, they're our golden eggs. They represent the commercially recoverable resources that have already been justified for development. And at the end of 2021, we had about 100 TCF of um, these gas reserves. It sounds like a lot of gas, but remember, we export about 75% of our gas as LNG to our regional partners in um, Southeast Asia who are very reliant on it. We also have a lot of contingent resources. So these are the resources that have been demonstrated to exist, but there's some impediment to their development. And in many cases, that impediment is high CO2 in the reservoirs. So though, again, 127 TCF sounds like a lot of contingent resources that could follow through and eventually become reserves, there's a lot of bad eggs there, like Humpty Dumpty here on my slide. <laughs> uh, so we can't necessarily assume that all those contingent resources or even a large portion of them are actually going to make it through to becoming reserves. Now here, um, I've taken our gas reserves and annual production data from ACA and used it to estimate when gas production is going to cease um, in our various basins if the status quo doesn't change. I've also estimated the, um, the scope one reservoir CO2 in these basins that would have to be um, produced and stored um, if, if um, each of these basins, if the um, companies in them were to um, follow the safeguard mechanism. So the situation is becoming very critical in Eastern Australia, and I think most people probably hear this through the media all the time. The Australian energy market operators already forecast a gas shortage by 2027. And the particularly critical area on the map down on the bottom right are the, the basins in red, the Gibson and the Bass, 
which don't have sufficient reserves to get beyond 2030 at the moment, unless the status quo changes. There's also a series of basins in um, East and Central Australia highlighted in yellow that only have enough gas reserves to get us through to somewhere between 2030 and 2040. So again, um, a significant gas security issue and more and more we're becoming reliant on the, the grey basins like Galilee and the um, Gunnedah and Beedaloo where there's um, undeveloped contingent resources um, to potentially flow through. Also, there's going to be potential issues with high CO2 in some of these reserves, particularly there's some high CO2 fields in the um, Cooper and the Bowen and in the Gibson Basin. So again, we need to identify geological storage opportunities if we're going to be able to continue to produce these um, resources. And the situation in East Australia is, is so critical now that there's actually plans to start importing LNG in Eastern Australia with two proposed LNG import facilities, even though we export quite a lot of LNG out of Queensland. And in um, Western Australia, the situation's a bit different. Um, the basins here generally um, have enough reserves to get through to 2030 or, or even 20, uh, sorry, 2040 or 2050. But the gas resources here are critical, first of all, for LNG exports, there's a lot from here, but more importantly, for our domestic gas supply to the, mi the mining sector. A lot of our mineral production at the moment is relying on the, um, the gas resources in Western Australia. It looks again like um, the situation is not so bad at first glance. Um, uh, a lot of um, reserves there to get us through to 2050, but there have been recent back uh, hurdles in several of these projects, again, which you've probably seen in the media. Um, LNG projects such as Woodside Scarborough project and Sandos Barossa project, even though there was identified reserves there and final investment decisions, they're now um, finding impediments in developing those. Also important to note that on the Northwest Shelf, many of the giant gas fields waiting to be developed there have very high CO2 and need a geological storage solution. And that's why there's been a lot of interest in um, recent years in greenhouse gas permits on the Northwest Shelf, which Geoscience Australia has um, been critical in supporting. So capturing and storing CO2 from gas fields is going to be essential to enable production of many of our remaining gas reserves. But as you can see here, the status of our CCS industry is well behind our gas industry. At this stage, we only have one commercial operating project, which is Gorgon, um, the world's largest CCS project. Santos has plans to begin CCS operations at their Moomba facility next year. Otherwise, the only other um, CCS project where there's actually progressed to a point of um, having identified contingent resources, a very small one, using a depleted field off the Perth Basin. Elsewhere, the projects are in various stages of being in development um, or being appraised. So there's a, a long way to go yet uh, until we've got the CCS resources to support the future gas developments. So a critical part of maintaining our energy security is then to understand what's the yet to find prospective resources um, for both gas and geological storage. And exploration by companies is really essential to identify um, new prospects and new leads that can potentially be converted into future reserves if commercial discoveries are made. What the companies focus on in exploration are the prospects and leads highlighted in purple here through their exploration programs. But unfortunately, we can't put an inventory together of what all the, um, the prospective resources are in Australia because it's very rare for companies to actually publish that. The, um, the major companies never publish their prospective resources and it's usually only the smaller companies looking for investment that will actually put that information out there. So if we want to understand what our prospective resource base is, um, we have to do this through the sort of work we do at Geoscience Australia with our pre-competitive basin studies, which then feed into our play-based resource assessments. And our focus on these studies is the level below the companies. It's at the bottom of the exploration triangle, which I think most of you are probably familiar with, where it's very regional, it's very basin level. So because of this regional scale, um, there's a much higher level of uncertainty in the um, prospective um, resource assessments that we undertake. <clears throat> and our focus is mainly on identifying what will be the locations and the scales of those future resource developments. And that uncertainty is particularly the case when we're dealing with what we call continuous resources. <clears throat> so what do I mean by continuous resources? Well, the opposite of continuous resources is discrete resources. And 
I'm showing um, the difference between these two here. The discrete resources, which are our conventional hydrocarbons, are highlighted by those blue boxes. Um, these occur in very discrete, mappable structural and stratigraphic traps, and they have distinct hydrocarbon water contacts. The, um, the actual rock volume that hydrocarbons occur in is fairly well constrained and predicted by the, um, the area of the trap. So we can make fairly accurate um, estimates of what the potential um, prospective resource is in these. The downside of the, the conventional resources is that most of the low hanging fruit's already been found and developed. So the opportunities are, are getting smaller and smaller. If we look at um, continuous resources, these are our unconventional hydrocarbons and they're occurring in continuous shale, coal, tight sand reservoirs. But these lack an obvious mappable trapping mechanism. The trap here is being driven by low permeability, overpressuring. Um, and there's therefore much more uncertainty and much more risk in actually um, identifying, testing and developing these resources. Um, there are, the upside is that the resource potential is often quite large and in at least one case with our coal seam gas resources east in Australia, that large potential has actually been realised with the, um, the coal seam gas resources there. But our other unconventional resources are still in a very early stage of um, testing and development. Now we get a very similar situation when we're dealing with um, CO2 geological storage. Here we also have discrete versus continuous resources. And the um, discrete resources here are our depleted hydrocarbon fields. Um, so these are areas where there's a hydrocarbon field that's already been um, produced and it's being repurposed for CCS storage. The advantage of these, uh, which um, I'm trying to highlight on the um, pyramid here, is that you can very quickly identify what the actual capacity of um, these depleted fields are um, and have a, a lot of certainty based on understandings of the um, reservoir performance while the field was producing. To understand the volumes in these, you really just need a good reservoir engineer and some field data, which unfortunately neither are always that easy to find. Um, and you can then make a reasonable estimate of what your um, hydrocarbon replacement volume will be for your CO2, but it's generally down in the megaton range and depleted fields are in high demand for other purposes such as gas storage and hydrogen storage as well. The continuous resources in the CCS space are our saline aquifers. So these are regionally extensive open aquifer systems and here, as I tried to show in the diagram, we inject the CO2 into the reservoir, migrates through buoyancy up to the base of a seal and then it migrates very slowly over tens or even hundreds of kilometres and as that plume's migrating, the CO2 is getting trapped in the pore throats and eventually it dissolves into the formation water or reacts with minerals. The downside is that um, there's a lot of uncertainty with these because they cover such a large area. And also the time frame you're looking at here is hundreds of years for the, for the um, process to occur, for the trapping mechanism to occur. But the upside is they have gigaton capacity. And when you think back to um, my earlier slide at the start, when we're dealing with 30 odd gigatons a year of um, emissions globally, we need big storage solutions to address that. Now, what often happens when we're evaluating these continuous resources, either hydrocarbon or storage resources, there's often an early push to try and understand what the scale of the potential resources could be, and to do this through a quantitative assessment. I've shown an example here from some unconventional gas assessments that were published in our ACRE publication a few years ago. But unfortunately, the nature of these, um, these resources, their very regional, um, extensive um, um, nature, means that the, um, the numbers that you get from these prospective estimates often vary by orders of magnitude. So just note that the y-axis on this chart is actually logarithmic and you're getting two orders of magnitude difference between various geologists who have assessed the same play in the same basin. We also find that um, if you do a bit of reality check on these estimates, many of them are just unrealistic. They're what I call mega numbers. And to give you an idea of how unrealistic, on the top of the graph here I've shown Australia's total discovered um, producible gas resources to date. So that's every basin, all reserves, all contingent resources, and all cumulative production. And one of these estimates is saying we can get more than that from one play in the Canning Basin. It's just not reality. 
What is probably more realistic is when we actually look at the contingent unconventional resources that have already been identified in the Cooper and the Canning Basin, we're getting down then to the more um, TCF scale. Those are about two TCF. So reality is probably going to be more in that one to 10 TCF range. So what's, what's causing this problem here? Um, it's what's often missing in these quantitative assessments of continuous resources is understanding the, um, the limited um, basin areas where you're actually going to get sweet spots for potential developments. Um, first of all, if we're looking at unconventionals, there may be trillions of cubic feet of theoretical in-place unconventional resources, but you don't have an actual resource if you can't move the gas and produce it to the surface, which is going to be the case across most of your basin area. So it's like poor old Bilbo Baggins trying to get the gold from under Smaug you can't get anything if the dragon won't move. <laughs> um, and saline aquifers, we have similar issue here. So often there's estimates that show hundreds of gigatons of theoretical storage capacity at a regional level. But all that's telling us is we've got a lot of pour volume when you're looking at the entire basin. You don't have a storage resource though if you can't get the CO2 in. And that's always the big challenge with um, CCS. So you can huff and puff and blow all you want. Um, but if you don't have good injectivity, um, you're just going to blow the reservoir down. So an analogy I've come up here to try and understand what's happening is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And we all go through this at, at different times in our life. Half of our country went through it in the last few days with the Melbourne Cup, where <laughs> we think we know more than we really do. Our confidence is high, but our knowledge is low. And what's happening in the, in the um, quantitative resource assessments, the geologists are actually doing the right thing. They know they're down at the bottom there where their knowledge is low and their confidence is low. And if you read the reports that come with these numbers, they'll go out of their way to say, you know, be careful how you use this number. And they'll have pages of all sorts of caveats to say, you know, why there's uncertainty with it and why you've got to be careful. But the problem is human nature is you see a number and you, your confidence skyrockets. <laughs> So the end user sees the number, and particularly if it's a probabilistic range of numbers, they go, oh, I can go to the bank with that. That's, that's a real number. But it's not. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's this unrealistic expectation of what the location and the scale of the resources will be um, because the knowledge base was low um, when those numbers were created. So how do we avoid then fertilising these assessments and creating unrealistic expectations of the um, development of these continuous resources. The key is understanding the natural variability and the geological controls for each of the resources that we're assessing and doing this at the gross reservoir seal or play level. And this is what we're talking about when we say play-based resource assessments. And I've tried to show it diagrammatically in the bottom left, um, not with the forest shrew sitting on the Nepenthes Lowy ID. <laughs> so, what we're looking at then is the relative prospectivity of um, each of our resources, both spatially across the basin extents, but also um, in three dimensions at each individual play level. And using that to build up our understanding of what the actual prospectivity is. Now, the first step in doing our play-based assessment is we need to actually go in and subdivide our basin stratigraphy into a series of potential host intervals, or what we term play intervals. So in most basins, these are what we, we call super sequences, where we have major stratigraphic packages bounded by unconformities or um, marine flooding surfaces. Generally, if we're in the um, conventional hydrocarbon space or the CCS space, these are reservoir seal pairs. But in unconventional hydrocarbons, it can just be sand intervals for tight sands, um, shale intervals, or coal measures. But what's really important is, and this is what we're really good at at GA, is you need supporting basin studies to really understand these play intervals and to be able to map them out um, accurately, reliably. Uh, well, seismic interpretations are particularly important. Um, generating rock property maps that will feed into our resource assessment is very important. And also just understanding the gross depositional environments and how they're varying spatially and through time. Now, once we've defined our regional play intervals, we then need to define a series of mappable risk element layers, which are those um, five layers you can see on that diagram there. We use these to constrain the prospectivity and have a set of criteria for each one that um, has to be met um, before we can say it's got high prospectivity. We cap it at a maximum of about four to five risk element layers. The reason for that is because 
we, um, we stack these or multiply them through, and if you've got too many layers, your end result is going to be low prospectivity. Now, for each of those risk element layers, there are two key things that we need to um, assess. The first is the probability, and it's always probability of geological success, we're not looking at economics here, the probability of geological success of the play presence. Um, so that's our play fairway. That's actually saying what we're looking at actually exists. It's been discovered somewhere. The next one that we look at is the repeatability, and that's really important, particularly if we're going to do quantitative assessments. And that's looking at heterogeneity, because nature's not kind to us geologists. It very rarely gives us boring layer cake homogeneous rock units. There's always a lot of heterogeneity in there. So they're the two elements we need to capture and use when we um, do our, our um, spatial analysis, our stacking to get our overall prospectivity map or common resident map. Now, that concept of split risking is, can sound a little bit confusing, so I went home and opened the packet of Smarties to try and explain the concept with Smarties. So if I'm, if I'm only interested in eating blue Smarties, because I personally think they're the best, then the, there's two questions I'm going to ask. The first is, do the good people at Nestle make blue Smarties? And secondly, how often am I going to get them? So the first question we can address here, open the box, put them on the table, there's a blue Smartie there. So if this was um, in the expiration sense, we would say that the probability uh, of the um, play presence is 100%. I'm 100% certain that blue Smarties exist, that they, ma they manufactured. The second question you then got to ask is, how often am I going to get them? If I want to have a meal of blue Smarties, I'm, I'm going to want about 10 of them. <laughs> so we then go and look and we say, well, only one out of my 10 Smarties in that box was blue. So the, um, the repeatability is 10%, and my overall chance of success is those two multiplied together. 100 by 10% equals a 10% chance of success. Um, now, that's a very simple explanation, but that's pretty much how exploration companies work. You know, they're looking at what's going to be their chance of success for whatever resource they're exploring. <laughs> and I hope I haven't made you hungry in the process. <laughs> <laughs> What we then got to do then is, is map a risk segment polygon around all those control points, around our Smarties. Now, the temptation is often to say, I'm just going to draw a circle around my blue Smartie and say I'm 100% certain there, and the rest, you know, very low certainty. Not a good idea when you're doing prospective resource assessments because you end up with a whole bunch of bullseyes around all your control points and then an amorphous blob where you don't have data and it's not very useful. What we do instead is we draw a polygon, a risk segment around all of that, and we just say the play presence is 100%. We know at least one control point in there has proven it exists, but the repeatability is low, it's 10%. That's basically what we do when we're doing the, um, the play assessments. And that's really important um, when we're, um, as I said, in nature, we've normally got heterogeneous um, systems, and that's shown nicely here on this diagram that um, Nadej Rolle and Katie Norton published for the um, Great Artesian Basin where our shales in brown are fairly discontinuous. Um, so there's a lot of heterogeneity there, a lot of variability in the connectivity of the, um, the reservoirs. So it's important to use that split risking to capture that in our assessments. Now, an important part of our play-based assessments is undertaking where practical what we call a, um, a post-drill analysis of the previous wells that have been drilled and to understand what the reasons were for lack of exploration success and therefore the geological risks that face explorers. And I'm using an example here um, from both the work done in Tegi and also in our AFA project. And this one is for carbon capture and storage. It's a scheme that Jeremy set up. It's very innovative, uh, adapting the, the petroleum industry's um, uh, approach to evaluating um, conventional hydrocarbons. So what we have to do is you have to go and do some detective work. We've got to do a, um, a post-mortem analysis um, of the drilling results. We're not so much looking at the quantitative data because hopefully that's been captured in the databases. It's all the other important qualitative stuff that the geologist who did the report is telling us, particularly for the intervals that weren't necessarily the target of that well. Um, so we get a lot of really useful information out of this, including calibrating our play presence and our play repeatability um, numbers um, that we use in the assessments. Now, in the examples I've shown here, we actually have done them in the um, Paducah Basin. Jeremy's done those and published them. Um, and um, we also did them in the Galilee Basin and the Adavale Basin um, for the TIGI program. 
But you can look at the number of wells there, 41, 161, 38. That's a manageable number of wells. Average geologist like me takes about a day to do a post drill analysis. We did have a super freak, Darren Ferdinando, who could do about four in one day, but, but most of us mere mortals, it's about a day's work to do this. <laughs> a lot, you get a lot out of it, but if you then go to very data rich areas, like we also had in the Tegi program in the Cooper and Manga and the North Bowen Basin, you get swamped with data and there's just no practical way to go in there and do a post drill analysis. And you risk introducing sampling bias if you just go in and subsample and say, I'm just gonna choose these 50 random wells. So this may be an opportunity in the future to look at um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually do this in-depth um, analysis for us, but hopefully we won't launch Skynet and the end of us all. <laughs> so I'm gonna move on now to um, the case studies um, from the play-based assessments that we've been doing. And I'm focusing in on that um, uh, Eastern Central Australian region where we've had all those um, basins where our reserves are probably going to run out somewhere between 2030, 2040, and we really need to identify if there are any super basins in this area. And we've been fortunate that there's been three programs in the last five to six years here. The GBA program, which really focused in on the unconventional resources. Uh, TEGI, which was looking at the conventional, unconventional hydrocarbons, CCS and hydrogen. And likewise, in the Western Aramanga Paderka, we've been similarly looking at all of the resources. And before I go any further, um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, a lot of credit to various GA geologists who have been working to develop our play-based assessment workflow over the last six years. I can't take um, all the credit for that. It began with the GBA program who used this play-based approach, continued through the TEGI program, and we're still using it in the AFA. Um, so the, these um, are the geologists who deserve all the credit um, as well as, uh, not just me, <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm just going to focus in on my example on the, um, on the Western Era Manga Paduka area and on CCS. So, um, here, now when we're assessing CO2 geological storage, we're only looking at large scale storage. We're not interested in little pilot projects. We want it to be industrial scale, at least a megaton a year. And that means we're basically looking at saline aquifers. And I'm just showing the concept here on the map um, where we inject down where the star is and we allow the CO2 to migrate up dip. And as I said earlier, it gets trapped over periods of 100 to 1,000 years as it migrates hundreds of, uh, or tens to hundreds of kilometres. Unfortunately, as I said, the time scales are pretty large on this. Um, now, we deliberately don't include depleted fields in our assessments. And the reason for that is a depleted field is a discovered resource. It's already there. Um, well, it's just a, a, a discovered and produced hydrocarbon field that's been repurposed. So, there's no point in including it in a um, yet to find assessment. Now for our CCS assessments, there's four risk elements that, um, that we include. The first is injectivity and storage effectiveness, containment and structural complexity. And I'll go through each of these and show some examples of how we actually assess them. So injectivity is probably the most important risk element to um, address in carbon capture and storage. And um, it's primary, this is evaluating the ability of the rocks to allow the um, CO2 and the water that's been pressured up at the injection site to actually flow through the rocks without actually um, compromising the reservoir or the seal. And it's mainly a function of the permeability and the thickness of our storage interval. And that's captured really nicely by this um, chart that the um, CO2 CRC published through a paper by Nick Hoffman where the reservoirs that we're looking at, this has the thickness on the y-axis and the permeability on the um, x. The ones that we're really looking for are the type ones that are um, in that green shaded area. Um, the type twos are in the yellow and then the ones that we're avoiding are the type three in red. Now just to explain them a bit better, the type one reservoirs are our golden eggs. So these are the ones that are gonna enable large industrial scale injection rates without pressuring up the reservoir, the, um, the storage interval, to the point where we have to put some management in place. So they're like our, um, our subsurface superhighways where the CO2 and the water can migrate fairly freely through there without the need for any sort of management strategies. They're fairly rare, but there has been one operating slightener since the late 90s. And if you can find these, um, they're worth their weight in gold. More often, CCS projects happen in type two reservoirs where the permeability thickness is still enough to allow industrial scale injection to occur, 
but you do get a pressure build up that has to be managed. And most of the existing projects fall in this category, including Gorgon. And these are areas where it's like a major road going through a city that um, if you start to really um, pump in a lot of CO2 into them, you're going to have to have a lot of management strategies to stop you know, the traffic jam from happening, to stop the pressure build up from occurring. And that's typically by producing the water out of the storage interval and injecting it into a shallower interval. And the type three ones are like um, back roads in the country. Um, the permeability thickness is so low, it's not going to sustain industrial um, scale injection. They're really only good for enhanced oil recovery projects or pilot projects. So we screen these out in our assessments. So the, um, the way that um, we assess injectivity, it's, it's probably the most difficult parameter to actually assess and map. Um, and we mainly do it by um, understanding the permeability thickness. Now, in the West Naramanga area, we've been doing this through wireline log petrophysics, as you can see here, and using that to understand what the permeability thickness is in our different intervals. We can then go into Petrel and produce the map on the top right there, which is a reservoir permeability thickness map. And that can then be used to um, do our injectivity risk element map. The other data sets that are really helpful, um, particularly if you don't have all the wine line log petrophysics, is routine core analysis, um, any net sand, isopack, and gross depositional environments that have been produced. If it exists, water production injection data is valuable, um, gives us some calibration on what the fluid flow is actually like in these and post-drill analysis to see qualitative information on the presence and effectiveness of the reservoirs. The second element that we look at is um, storage effectiveness. Um, and this is where we're looking at where we have suitable um, conditions in the subsurface to allow high um, storage volumes to actually be stored. Um, now, uh, for the CO2 um, um, density, uh, I've shown a CO2 density curve here, as you go deeper in the subsurface, the, um, the density of CO2 increases and you get to a point at about 800 metres below your pressure datum where the density really kicks off. You can see it going off to the right there. That's the point where it's become super critical, where it's become a, a really dense fluid-like um, entity um, that allows high storage um, effectiveness. But we've also got to take into consideration porosity because in most basins, porosity drops off with depth. So there tends to be a Goldilocks zone where you get the high porosities, ideally above 20%, but the high CO2 densities as, as well, which gives us our most effective um, areas for storage. But in a lot of cases, we also have to just um, also include um, ones which have more medium prospectivity, where the porosities are going to be more in the 10 to 20% range, which are still usable, just not as high potential as um, the greater than 20%. Now to assess this, um, it's really important to have accurate depth structure maps based on really good integrated well seismic interpretations. Other important data to have, any regional temperature and salinity maps are really important to understand the CO2 density, any um, porosity depth functions that we can put together and we use that quite a bit in the TEGI program to understand um, where the most effective porosities were. Obviously wireline log petrophysics and routine core analysis again and once again, common theme in most of this, post-drill analysis, being able to get that qualitative information where geologists have said, good visual porosity, gives you a nice indication if you don't actually have the quantitative data. The third best risk element is containment, um, and it's essential in any storage project to demonstrate that you can effectively contain um, the CO2 through the presence of, of a um, effective top seal. <coughs> Um, now, the highest prospectivity is where we get very thick homogeneous units. So that'll be your marine shales, or if you've got a lucky enough to have a salt layer above your reservoir, that's where we know guaranteed good containment. But again, nature's cruel, and we've often got to deal with more heterogeneous units, um, particularly in intercontinental basins with fluvial lacustrine systems. So it may be locally very effective, where we've got thick seals forming locally, but they're not continuous. And that's where, again, capturing the play presence versus the repeatability becomes really important to highlight that heterogeneity. So the important data sets we need um, to evaluate this, obviously regional seal thickness maps are the most important and underpinning those with good seismic interpretations and um, electrophasis data from the wells. And there's an example of that here from some of Nadege and Katie Norton's work where um, we use that particularly in the um, AFA project to understand where we had thick effective shales. And you can also see 
in the deeper sections there, the heterogeneity that you, you tend to get in the more fluvial lacustrine systems. Other important data, if you've got it, seal capacity data is um, invaluable. Uh, any sort of evidence that there's been leakage through the seals, so grain oil inclusion data in your shales, um, or even just hydrocarbons that have been recovered from the shale, indicating that it, it may be leaky. Happens quite often in the Aramanga Basin. Uh, gross deposition of environment maps for the seal, important, and once again, post-drill analysis. The final element that we look at is structural complexity, and this is where we're looking at if the structural architecture is either favourable or unfavourable for this regional migration of a CO2 plume without having leakage back to the surface. So the most favourable conditions where I've put the little smiley faces is where we get low regional dips going up towards a nice broad structural culmination. They're the areas where you're going to really encourage the slow migration of the CO2 plume and um, the trapping of the CO2 behind that. The, um, the Humpty Dumpties, the bad eggs that we're trying to avoid, are the areas where we've got potential fault leakage, taking the CO2 plume back up to the surface, or also, around, particularly around basin margins, where the reservoir and seal become exhumed and actually are sticking out in outcrop at the surface. Obviously, we don't want to be migrating a CO2 plume back up into outcrop, so they're the areas that we try and screen out when we assess these. Now, the supporting basin studies we need to do this. Um, seismic interpretations, important, but particularly based on uh, recently reprocessed data, which has been a big emphasis for us in the Western Aramanga Simpson area, or modern seismic data. You really want to be able to see um, if these faults are extending up into the, um, the subsurface, which we're able to do in Western Aramanga by reprocessing the data, but it wasn't possible with the older data. Also important for this is structural models. Again, that's something we're very good at at GA. We do a lot of work on that. There's an example of one down in the, the bottom there um, where we can build these models up in Petrel or other software packages. Um, Neotectonic studies where we, um, we look at any evidence for recent tectonic activity from earthquake data and that that's telling us that there's faults in the area that could be active. And here post-drill analysis is really, really important because when we do post-drill analysis, we can actually tell if the trap that was targeted by that well is what we call a valid, dry valid structure, meaning it had closure, it had an effective seal, there was, the only reason it was dry was because no hydrocarbon had actually got to it, versus a, um, an invalid trap where there's a fault going through it or some other leakage pathway. So the post drill is really important for um, the structural complexity. So now this is um, showing the end result then of going through and evaluating those four risk elements in the Western Aramanga Basin. And I've shown all the supporting data that was used to do that. We go through there on the left and we multiply through each one of those. Now, remember what I said earlier that when we do the prospectivity maps like this, it's only based on the play presence. We don't actually put the, um, the repeatability into this. The repeatability is important if you go down the quantitative path because it gives you an overall chance of success. But the meaningful maps come from actually um, building up the, the play presence, the play fairway maps. And it's showing here in the Western Aramanga Basin, we have a very large area that's um, in the green colour that has medium to high prospectivity for CCS. So a very um, exciting area to actually look at opportunities for CCS, um, particularly into the future if there's high CO2 discoveries. Now, an important outcome from our assessments too is what we call a weakest link map that comes out of the, um, um, the software where we create these maps. And what this is doing is it's showing you the risk element that has the lowest chance of geological success in your assessment and is therefore dictating what the overall prospectivity is. Now, I've tried to highlight where those green areas were, the high prospectivity areas with those grey diagonal hashes. And in that area, the weakest link is structural complexity and our storage effectiveness. And the reason for that I've tried to highlight by showing the seismic data coverage here is because we don't have a lot of seismic data, so we don't have a lot of confidence in our depth structure maps or our understanding of where the faults are. Now, the, and also in the centre of the basin, when we start to get outside of that perspective area, the weakest link there is injectivity. Um, and that's because, as I said, you're in the deepest part of the basin, so the permeability has really dropped off now, and that's what's controlling your prospectivity there. And these weak link maps are particularly useful for identifying um, where the gaps are in our data and knowledge and therefore where to focus our studies to really reduce this risk for any companies who want to go out there and um, look for these opportunities. So I'm just going to finish now by 
showing the overall results of our assessments across this whole eastern central Australian area from the three different programs. And the first example here is the, um, the regional CO2 geological storage assessment. Um, you can see on there, there's a lot of green areas across the, the western area of Manga, the Cooper area of Manga and the Galilee. But first, what's really important is the, um, the North Bowen Basin is an unhealthy shade of red and orange there. <laughs> so it's highlighting that this is an area where there aren't any obvious CO2 geological storage opportunities. And that was actually verified about um, 10 or so years ago by the Zerogen project, who demonstrated that it's very limited in its potential. Now, what I've done here is I've extracted out just the high prospectivity areas and colored these in green. So you can see just how much of this area has potential for geological storage. And it's not just occurring at one stratigraphic level. In the Galilee, there's two intervals that have high prospectivity. Cooper Umanga, there's six intervals. That's really good. Um, particularly if we're worried about groundwater in the shallow section, we can still go deeper and avoid that. And then two play intervals in the Aramanga Basin. So in terms of our energy super basins, we've got the first part of the assessment done. We can see where the high CO2 storage is. Now let's look at the hydrocarbons. And for this, I'm only doing the, um, the um, coal seam gas resources. They're the most prospective ones in this area. And it's highlighting that um, in the Cooper um, Basin, these are slightly different um, coal seam plays. They're the deep coal plays at about 2,500 metres and greater. But the work from the um, GBA program highlighted that there's quite a few fairways there where there's, um, there's high to medium prospectivity. And, and these deep coal plays are actually the main focus for unconventional exploration in the Cooper Basin at the moment. The Galilee Basin has a lot of green areas where there's potential for coal seam gas. And, one of those areas is actually um, very close to coming into development, the um, Galilee Energy's Glenaris project, which has 2,500 petajoules of gas. If it goes ahead, that will really open up the Galilee Basin, but has been a lot of problems actually getting the gas to produce. They just keep producing lots of water. The Paterka West Naramanga area from our assessment, even though it was the target of, a, of um, coal seam gas exploration a decade ago, it doesn't have the, um, the potential for coal seam gas in this area. It does, however, have um, good potential for um, conventional liquid-prone hydrocarbons, um, which isn't shown on this map, but in broadly the same area as the orange polygon you see there. So now I've gone in and I've extracted out the high prospectivity um, coal seam gas plays and, and coloured these in that orangey um, pink colour and superimposed those on our high prospectivity geological storage areas so we can start to see where things are aligning. And hopefully you can see then the Cooper Basin, we're getting alignment of um, potential uh, coal seam gas fairways um, with lots of areas with um, high geological storage potential. So indicating, you know, we could be getting that super basin there. Galilee area manga, um, similar. Um, there's, uh, although it doesn't cover all the areas where there's um, gas potential, there are a lot of um, storage opportunities there where the um, future gas resources may be found. But the North Bowen Basin, unfortunately, is what we call a disadvantaged basin. Although it has a lot of um, coal seam gas potential, and actually there's a lot of production already occurring there, you don't have the geological storage opportunities to actually do anything about your um, scope one CO2 emissions. So if you're going to um, have a plan to um, abate those, you're looking at a more costly option of having to transport the CO2 out of the basin into somewhere like the Galilee or the Surat. And finally, under the TEGI program, there's also an evaluation of the um, renewable hydrogen potential in the area based on um, renewable energy capacity and groundwater feedstock. And this is now giving us another layer to our assessment. We can once again see Cooper Manga Basin has lots of green, lots of potential there to produce renewable hydrogen, but the Galilee Basin only has a few areas in green. So it's now looking a bit more disadvantaged if into the future we want to move away from fossil fuels into renewable hydrogen. And so uh, here I've just superimposed all three layers. So the renewable hydrogen is in the blue cross hatches. And what this is identifying for us is we may have an energy super basin in the Kufra Aramanga area where we get all three elements, you know, gas resources, CCS opportunities, and renewable hydrogen opportunities all occurring. Galilee unfortunately doesn't have the hydrogen opportunities and it's really dependent on that Glenaris project getting up. And North Bowen, unfortunately, doesn't have the CCS opportunities um, to enable it to, um, to move into that clean energy future. 
Now I'm just having a closer look here at the, um, the Cooper Basin. Um, I've also put on here the, the gas fields in red. So um, this is, as I said, an area where everything sort of lines up. Um, the main issue here is really the end of life of the reserves. At the moment, if none of those conventional or unconventional um, contingent resources move through to being reserves, it's um, going to stop producing the, the gas by about 2031. That may not be enough time to actually get the renewable hydrogen industry up and running. But it is an area that, that is really um, suited to that, um, particularly having all the existing infrastructure there that could actually be used um, for a hydrogen industry, such as the um, depleted fields that are there. Now, the other issue with the Cooper Basin is there are a lot of geological storage opportunities and Santos is already about to get underway with one of those at the um, um, Moomba CCS site. But there's also a lot of legacy wells there and that can be a problem with um, long range saline aquifer storage, um, particularly if those wells are leaky. So it'd be nice to have an option up your sleeve where you don't have that issue. And that's where our Western Era Manga assessment comes in that area highlighted over there on the left with the, um, the pinky coloured polygon, there's only about four wells in that area and we've actually done some work with risk advisory to um, quantify, even though I'm not supposed to be talking about numbers. <laughs> and that area has a, um, from the work we've done, would have an estimated ultimate storage potential of 29 gigatons. Um, now that is a pretty large number and it's unrealistic you, unless you can access that entire area, but as a bit of a reality check, um, and I don't want to end on a downer, remember what we're emitting um, annually, um, globally, about 32 gigatons. So you would need to um, have one of these areas every year just to capture all the global CO2 emissions. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the problem ahead of us and why it's so important that we, um, we identify where these um, high potential storage sites are. And just finally, the um, we, the important number here, though, is the one on that last dot point, that a 50 megaton project here would have a footprint of only 38 square kilometres. So there's a lot of room to move. That's over a large area of 22,000 square kilometres. A lot of room to move there to actually find one or more industrial scale projects. So um, that's probably the more important number that you get out of these assessments rather than the really big mega number. So I'll just quickly finish by um, the main point. So all too often our resource assessments begin with a, a very quick fit for purpose quantitative assessment but these assessments usually produce inflated numbers and unrealistic expectations of the locations and scale of future resource developments but the play-based resource assessments we're doing at GA give us a, um, a workflow that provides a systematic approach to to move up the Dunning-Kruger curve up towards the slope of enlightenment um, building up our, our knowledge and our confidence using trusted um, data and um, underlying basin studies. And finally, um, I've shown an example of how we've applied this um, technique into the um, Eastern Central Australian area and shown that there's a potential energy super basin that could be really critical for our energy security future in Eastern Australia in the Cooper and Manga region. That's it, thanks. <laughs>